Hi guys and welcome back to this week's episode of the In The Hub podcast, brought to you by Playbox Technology UK. In the final part of this two-part series, we hear more from Paul Tyson of Studio Tyson on why he loves the broadcasting industry. We explore the concept of multimedia, Paul's pick for the most exciting developing technology in broadcasting, and what he envisions for the future of our industry. Hope you enjoy. Sorry if this uh, causes any jealousy amongst your clients or anything like that, but do you have a kind of uh, a personal favourite project that you've carried out with Studio Tyson up to this point? Well, I'd say um, that um, probably the the biggest one that I've done, biggest project that I've done is Kobo Center, what what used to be called Kobo Center here in Detroit, Michigan. That's a place where people like Jimi Hendrix and uh, The Doors and Led Zeppelin, they've all played at Kobo, Kobo Hall here in Detroit. Well, around 2011 uh, timeframe, they basically knocked down the old um, concert hall and they rebuilt it as a exposition center, as a complete exposition center. It's always been a concert hall plus an expo center, but they decided to to get rid of the concert hall part, which that was uh, to the regret of quite a few people because of the history, the rich history that's there. But in uh, 2012, they were uh, looking for digital signage solutions. And um, the company I was with at that time uh, which isn't too far from Detroit, uh, we, we won the bid and got in there and supplied uh, 100 screens. Uh, oh, wow. okay. And the, the purpose of that was mostly for doing uh, <clears throat> meeting rooms, like conference rooms. And the purpose of having this, that many screens was that each conference room had a screen outside the door that was mounted vertically like a poster portrait orientation and it would have the logo and tell the information about who was in that room so if it was bmw or this is this is where they have the international auto show every year <clears throat> so a lot of the big car companies would come in and rent those rooms and uh so i i got to do the signage project on that so that was a, a big one and then uh probably my my biggest project that involved um, Playbox technology would have been the city of Wyandot, And that was uh, somewhere around 2014 or yeah. so. Uh, delivered a, a lot of equipment and uh, production and post-production equipment to city of Wyandot. But one of the things they wanted to do besides recording and play out automation with, with Airbox, they wanted to be able to go in the field uh, with their production truck and be able to broadcast that remote production truck live as they were doing it uh, back to their control room and back through the play box system. And we did uh, actually achieve that goal. And uh, and delivered a system that could actually do uh, <clears throat> transmission of the signal over public internet from a remote location with their production truck all the way back to the studio and then out over the airwaves locally in Wyandotte, Michigan. Yeah, I love hearing when a project goes well, especially when a playbox is involved, of course. But um, yeah, it's, it's it's nice to know that these these uh, obviously these corporations around by you, these companies, uh, things like exhibition halls, um, centers, and stuff like that. It's nice to know that they can come to Studio Tyson and get advice on on every part of it. So it's not as if you're having to pass them to different companies in the workflow. And, right. And, you know, it's nice just having that one central hub, isn't it? Which I think is absolutely great. Right, and you know, I I think the 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 funniest part about that story <clears throat> with the uh, Kobo Center, which is now today is called TCF Center because that's a that's a big bank here in Michigan, and TCF took over 
ownership a few years ago. So now it's called TCF Center. But the funny thing about that was that the the one of the reasons that we won that project when push came to shove, because we had some competition uh, locally here, but one of the reasons we, we won the project was because we gave a seminar mm -hmm. uh, uh, back in, it was probably three years prior to the Kobo project, where we were just uh, touring the state of Michigan. We did a three city tour at uh, small hotels, and we just <clears throat> basically talked about stuff like digital signage, playback automation systems with Playbox, and also content creation systems, uh, various nonlinear systems being shown. But we showed the signage um, software at one of those seminars, and it just so happened that out of the eight people that were there that morning, one person that was in that audience happened to be a decision maker for Kobo. Got it. Okay. That's brilliant. So it just, it's funny, but when it, when it came around years later, that yeah. project came, you know, and they were, they were asking him, uh, do you have any recommendations on companies or people or, or solutions that you might've seen? He said, yes, absolutely, I do. Fantastic. You must have <laughs> left still, such a good impression. He, he still had those brochures and the and the business <laughs> cards <laughs> from years before. Oh, so uh, it just goes to show you just never know who's sitting in the audience. And it, re it really only takes one person. You know, um, if you have the right person watching and you're showing or saying the right thing and you're in the same room, Sometimes you make those kind of big connections. Yeah, that turned into almost a half a million dollar project. Obviously, Paul, we, we spoke a little earlier about uh, keeping up to date with uh, monthly magazines and things like that. I think obviously things have changed a little bit in terms of, of news and media coverage in our industry, um, as most things do. Right. Um, how, you know, what's your kind of weapon of choice? How do you keep on top of, of new changes and in innovations in our industry? Because there's so many, aren't there, on a daily basis? Right. Yeah. And it, it is kind of funny because, well, it's not really funny. I guess I shouldn't use the term funny, but it, it's, it's definitely different now because, you know, 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, you could pretty much pick a handful of magazines and you'd say, well, all of the top products are going to be advertising these magazines. And so if it's something I need to know about, surely I will find it yeah. either running as an advertisement in a magazine, or maybe there will be an article about this new and exciting technology or something somewhere that you could count on the magazines to tell you about, right? You let, you let them kind of do the, the work of, of making the connections with the uh, solutions suppliers, right? Be it, software or hardware. Uh, but so these days, I mean, really, at this point, it's trade shows like the National Association of Broadcasting show, that still remains a big one. Uh, now I've heard that the the one that was planned for October of this year apparently was canceled. Uh, because I know somebody that uh, went out there and, and was planning on going and then he told me Nope, <laughs> they're not doing it so i guess it's postponed again so that was that was odd because originally uh and traditionally the nab show takes place every april of every year and uh so this year they moved it to october and up until september as far as i know it was still on but i guess they they decided to cancel at the last minute for whatever reason but that show is a fantastic show if you can yeah. if you can find your way there uh it is a great great wealth of information and i've always said uh, about the nab show that basically you can get a year's worth of education in a day <laughs> yeah so you know if you're going for several days you can get several years worth of education by simply walking around the floor looking at what's being shown and talking to the various uh developers and manufacturers that are present at that show it's just a great great way to find excellent and valid information uh, and then the other way of course is the internet 
and just kind of uh, poking around the internet. Uh, these days, if I'm looking for technology like cameras and, and lighting and stuff like that, um, a lot of times I'm looking at nofilmschool.com. Okay, yeah. I think that's what it's called. No, no film school.com. They have a lot of really good and detailed information about camera technology, acquisition and recording technology, and a lot of times editing uh, technology. Of course, YouTube isn't a bad place to look, I guess, uh, for, for certain types of information. And then there are still um, the the kind of the old names which are still around like post magazine uh and a few others that that still crank stuff out digitally i'm not sure what happened to dv magazine and videography i'm not sure if they're gone or what happened i remember about 10 years ago they were were telling us in their printed magazine that they're getting ready to go all digital and i know they did and they took it all online but i'm not sure I, I really haven't looked at that in quite some time. But a lot, a lot of times these days, I have things coming at me, you know, via email, right? So I'll get an email from Line 6 or Steinberg or, you know, this company or that company telling me about their latest technology. And I click the link and go learn about their, whatever their latest software releases are and so forth. Yes, yeah. Oh god, the in, the internet has just been such a, a game changer in in terms of that kind of stuff, isn't it? You can get info from so many different sources, and they don't necessarily have to. I, I just think it's good that obviously people don't have to set up publishing houses and magazines anymore. They can kind of start a blog online, and you know right. their, their voices no more. Uh, you know they're on a level playing field essentially with 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 publications and and things like that. Right. I mean, it, it's it's kind of a. I suppose it's a that there are some pluses and minuses because yes, it has democratized the um, the information flow somewhat, right? Yeah. Because now anybody can write or push anything that they want, right? Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> There's really nobody to stop them from from saying what they want or necessarily checking everything, fact checking, and so forth. Um, so that has some pluses and minuses. I mean, you know, um, sometimes I, I see things that I don't agree with, you know, or, yeah. oh, or sure. I wonder how that's even going to be possible. Is it, is it too good to be true? Yeah. You know, there's, there's that side of it and, and you, you don't always have, uh, like full protection, right. Of the, yes. what you're reading is actually proven or factual. Yeah, that's, oh, that's the only that's the only catch with the internet. <laughs> yeah, oh no, definitely. Yeah, if it doesn't go through a kind of editorial process, fact checking process, then yeah, you've got to be yeah. really, really careful about what you're reading. Yeah, because um, no, nobody's neck is on the line, you know, <laughs> yeah. so to speak. Oh, 100%. so <laughs> you have to be a little bit judicious in your, you know, what you choose to believe or not, just like anything else, I guess, you know, on the internet. It's kind of the it's still kind of the wild west as they I've heard that term used quite a bit, you know. The, yeah. I think it's only <laughs> gonna get more wild pool, to be honest, as time goes on. Um, what what's what's funny is that uh I still remember a time when you know first seeing the internet in the middle nineties, yeah, when there was nothing there, really. I know it's Much. it's crazy. It blew my mind to turn up on the internet at, at such an early stage, and there, there's very little. I mean, still a huge amount there, but but nowhere near as much as as the the, the, the vast space there is now, and, and the vast amount of right. websites and entities and and things right. like that. And I I still remember thinking to myself, wow, there's really nothing. There's not that much out here yet, but. You could clearly see that eventually <laughs> that the blank spaces will be filled. <laughs> and yeah. sure enough, <laughs> God, you know, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? It's absolutely crazy. Um, build, build it and they will come, right? That, that <laughs> yeah. was the uh, 
the old saying is build it and they will come. Well, they built the internet yep. and man, did they come. <laughs> oh yes. And they, well, they gave us the tools as well, didn't they, to, to carry on right. building it. And it was, you know, it's, it's just almost got out of control at this point. So um, I, I would say that that is probably, you know, watching the internet come from its infancy yeah. to where it is today is almost as is probably maybe more mind blowing than than what I've seen happen with digital video. Yes. <laughs> Watching actually, it yeah. come from its infancy with tape and the the painstaking process of editing uh to where it is today where it's all just drag and drop and and now what you have automated systems that will edit for you <laughs> right just give give it a hundred clips and it will automatically edit everything together for you yeah i mean it ties quite nicely into the next question paul which was was basically over the last kind of 20 years of, of broadcasting or so i know it's uh casting it back quite far there but uh, what do you think has been the kind of single most influential change to, to you and the, the way you do business? Well, I'd, I'd have to probably say streaming video uh, would would be the winner in that category because that that's another technology that I <clears throat> remember early discussions about streaming video. Uh, and when it was uh, when I was living out in Philadelphia in the mid 90s, I remember uh, I was actually working for a, a dealership, a video dealership there in Philly that was selling all kinds of video editing solutions. We were an Avid dealer, we were a toaster dealer, and we were also a dealer of uh, silicon graphics computer systems. And those were the ones that were the heavy duty computer systems that were doing um, you know, they probably use those on the early versions of Toy Story and, and so forth. It, it was a IRIX based, Unix based platform. And Silicon Graphics, you know, they had the processing power to do tons of 3D animation and so forth. But, and they were far ahead of where PCs and Macs were at that time. But I remember Silicon Graphics talking about the Orlando project and the Orlando project to test out the premise of streaming video over a network connection into the home, okay, to the final viewer from a centrally located server or servers, like a server farm. And so uh, that they had talked about, they had, I think, a hundred they had like 100 homes that were set up to receive the signal. And at that time, it was probably fairly low resolution, maybe like 320 pixels by 240 pixels or something like that, <laughs> right? That's what you would see on the receiving end, right? <laughs> and you had to have a special computer or a special type of set-top box in order to receive that signal. But I remember uh, that they they ran that experiment, and I mean they proved that it could be done, but to to you know at a very low resolution at the time due to bandwidth limitations, right? And um, and I'm not sure what type of bandwidth they were actually using, but I know that at that time those were the very early internet days in terms of talking about public internet. And I don't, I don't know if it was actually done over public internet. I don't think so. I think it was done via some type of dedicated connection, but to watch it go from, from that level of low quality video um, to what happened with the introduction of Netflix maybe 15 years later, I'm trying to think when Netflix came out. I think Netflix came out sometime around 2008, yeah. I want to say. Or... Like, obviously, they were in the business of shipping out DVDs, weren't they, for that for those first few? Yes, then, yes, um... that's where they started. And that's when I started with Netflix. Yeah. And um, But to see how far they have developed the compression technology and the streaming technology in order to actually deliver a service like Netflix. Uh, that really blew my mind, you know, seeing that happen in somewhere in around 2007, 2008, uh, e even though it was still in its infancy, it was pretty mind blowing to see 
how far it had come and also to see the the kind of minimum amount of bandwidth that it could be done with you know using just a standard internet connection and then using either a low powered pc or a low powered like a um something like a nintendo uh right the nintendo could actually be used as a set top delivery box for netflix as could the uh, xbox and playstation and that was that was a big wow factor for me to see wow <laughs> i can use my kids gaming system as a set top receiver to watch movies on netflix wow <laughs> yeah and again all coming back to that kind of multimedia uh, kind of idea isn't it and it's it's right you know yes delivering on the on those early promises of multimedia what it could be yeah you know someday yeah and just seeing it come all the way from laser disc with pioneer laser discs and and elo graphics touch screens back in the late 80s and early 90s and then all the way to to where we are today wow just unbelievable yeah Unbelievable. Oh, that's the word for it. It's wow, isn't it? Yes. It's just wow. Um, so streaming streaming video probably takes the cake in terms of uh, most revolutionary, uh, mind-blowing <laughs> development of technology. I, I couldn't really say it better myself, Paul. Um, you know, I, I'm going to try and rack your brain here again, uh, Paul. And it's, you know, with all the kind of developing technologies that are coming out, we've come so far with, with streaming video. Um, and obviously, a lot of people talk about uh, 5G, obviously, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality. Is there kind of one of these these more developing technologies that, that you think has the most potential for broadcasting? And, and, and why do you think that? Well, I, I should just re mention real quick that I have been quite for quite some time I've been working with uh, VR type technology because my my brother-in-law has been delivering solutions um, which started off as stereo video where you shoot using two cameras and then you watch it using goggles um, and he he started doing that around uh, the early 2000s and I've been supplying um, systems, one of which was a play box system. Uh, and that play box system actually traveled all over the country from 2007 through 2011. Uh, oh, okay. and, and had been used at places like Boeing and uh, Texas Instruments and the U.S. Air Force and other uh, to the play box system was used to deliver uh, two channels of locked video, left eye and right eye, to classrooms of people that were watching it through goggles. And so been been working with the that technology. Now that is a little different than VR, right? It's not the the fully immersive 360. That was more like uh, I don't know what we called it. 3D three-dimensional video or stereo yeah. stereo video and programs like Adobe Premiere, Grass Valley, Edius, uh, Di now DaVinci Resolve, all of those support stereo editing of video. But uh, you know, I, I think it would be great if we could actually get to the point where we're we're doing holographic video projection, uh, video playback, and maybe that will uh come to be someday but i think the primary challenge with that technology with the v the vr stuff right now is the box on face issue <laughs> so people you know i i know that certainly there are some people that don't mind strapping the goggles onto their head and, and wearing the goggles for vr experience but eventually we're going to get to a point where you don't need to do that yeah i think yeah with most things isn't it in, in tech it's it's you get it up to a kind of uh, manageable sellable point and then the focus really is on on getting it lightweight getting it more agile getting it mobile um right because we've we've kind of already seen what's happened in the movie indus industry yeah with the with the 3d uh movies yes. right wearing the glasses and so forth and i'm not sure about um 
the UK and, and Europe, but here in the States, that kind of was like almost like a bubble where it, it happened for a few years and people did it and wore the glasses in the movie theater. But then people just kind of lost interest in it. And I don't even know if they make movies anymore That's in 3D. I, yeah, it's exactly the same here, Paul. It's, it, it was very much a kind of, not a, I wouldn't say a fad, it, it really kind of had its place. Uh, and it had a lot of people really excited. But again, yeah, you'd take the glasses off halfway through the movie because your eyes are aching or your eyes are hurting. Right. Um, you look around you in the cinema, everyone else is doing the same as well. So. Yeah. And I, I kind of feel, I kind of feel bad for my brother-in-law because hmm. he jumped into that industry with both feet, you know, yeah. And, yeah. and, and it's like, it, it kind of, it, it started to go, it seemed like it was going. And I remember being at the NAB show and seeing Sony talking about it and Panasonic talking about it and how they were going to bring you live basketball games in 3d you know and they were selling cameras and switchers and everything else that could do all the production pipeline stuff in in 3d left eye right eye and then you'd watch it and you'd see it in 3d i mean it seemed like a great idea but it's just that that last part about having to wear the goggles or having to wear the glasses in order to experience that that seem to kind of throw things off. And so uh, I think what will, will happen is we'll probably revisit that type of technology, the VR stuff, but, but they're going to figure out a way to do it without glasses or without goggles. And I've seen it demonstrated at NAB. There are companies that are working on that technology uh, using holographic uh, systems, but we'll have to see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I I have every trust in these companies and and every faith. Obviously, there's companies working so hard on it. Um, I, yeah, I think VR, AR, two two good opportunities to to pass up. Essentially, I think they really do will have their place. Um, and we'll have to right. see. Yeah. I think now it's it, it it seems like I'm sorry to interrupt, but it just seems like it's kind of relegated at this point to companies that are doing things like CAD design where you want to zoom in and and do exploded views of a design project or a, a either a building or some type of machinery and you want to get in and look at it in 3d i can certainly see for those vertical niche markets those vertical markets that uh, vr or augmented reality would continue to evolve and be important be something that's used every day but i think unfortunately for for the majority of uh the public it just kind of seemed like something it was interesting for a minute and then now it kind of the interest has kind of waned yeah uh, that's the problem with this it can really go either way can't it you, you love it one day and then a uh, sentiment yeah. turns against it the next so it's you know uh, it makes it exciting but it's it's so unpredictable yes um, it is and uh, we're, we're talking about the future a little bit more here as well paul and this is a question that we ask at the end of every podcast um and that's just if you could sum it up in in one word and one word only what do you envision for the future of the broadcasting industry well, <laughs> that is a good question. <laughs> I mean, I guess we're kind of already there in the future in some ways that now things have we've we've seen the evolution take us to the point of YouTube, where everything is interactive, right? You, you decide when you want to watch something. Uh, you you watch it on your terms. You pause it. You play it when you want want to see it. Uh, so, where do we go from here? Well, obviously the resolution keeps going up, right? So we've kind of already been there and done that with 4K, and now we're talking about eight, you know, 6K, 8K, 12K, and so forth. So I imagine that will continue to evolve, and that those technologies, the resolution argument seems to carry a lot of weight and everybody takes it very seriously, right? From the point of acquisition through editing and, and delivery, um, it seems like an obvious and valid uh, argument that higher resolution is better, right? Um, 
But I guess probably this, the question ultimately will tie back to what we were just talking about a minute ago. I, I can certainly see that having a full three-dimensional view will be something that uh, we'll see at some point in the future, but I just don't know how long it's going to take. But I, I can see that it, it seems fairly obvious that uh, hol holograms and holographic projection will be uh, something that we see at some point, but I just don't know when. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it is exciting. So, it, you know, Paul, if it was one word, what, what would you say the word is? Would you say resolution or would you say? Um... I, would, I would actually say um, a combination of, of higher resolution plus introducing the third dimension. I, I don't think yeah. that, there, that the industry has completely given up on the idea. I just think it's waiting for the technology to catch up with the the premise of the the idea of having a VR uh, or a AR, you know, I mean, I, I've been looking at the stuff from, I remember when Microsoft rolled out their uh, Holo, Holoset uh, headset, and it's been a while, you know, now since that's been out. And it, it is interesting, you know, the idea of augmented reality, right, where you look around your room and you, you you can put a picture on a wall if you want to <laughs> yeah, yeah or and if you want to you know do whatever you want with with these different types of media right yeah. uh, that's interesting i'm not really sure how how that fits in with practical day-to-day -day life <laughs> you know the fact that it can be done like right now you would do it through something like a microsoft holoset or the oculus right or something like that you but and i see that for gamers you know certainly for gaming i can see that the, the headsets would be something that gamers would probably put up with right yeah but but for the mass public uh they're gonna want it without the headset uh without oh, yeah. the box on face so yeah. um i i do think that it will eventually come around and we will see a day where, where we can kind of see like, uh, what was it? Princess Leia on the original star Wars when oh, she yes. was, uh, projected from R2D2. Yeah. R2D2 projected the hologram of Princess Leia asking for help. <laughs> I thought, I can, yeah. I can At the time that just seemed a million years away. That did, uh, you know, even when I first saw that, when I was, when I was a kid, I was like, well, that, that is some proper like future tech. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I felt I, it was so far out of, out of reach. Yeah, it is. It's going to take a lot to get there. You know, I, I don't know. Um, I, I do see uh, technology like uh, projection mapping. Right. And for anybody that's not familiar with that, you can look up projection mapping on YouTube and see demonstrations of what can be done with, you know, a PC or a Mac and a projector. You know, it's pretty amazing. You see that a lot of times at concerts. Um, well, at least back when they had concerts. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get back to having one. concerts. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yep. uh, you, you know, projection mapping is, is something that is so powerful. And so you can see what can be done with a simple 2D projector. So I can only imagine what would be possible with having three-dimensional projection systems. But uh, I guess we'll just have to wait and see uh, how long it takes. But I have a feeling it's going to be still some years out before we actually see holographic projection system. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as, as long as they get it right, Paul, uh, right. you know, as long as it comes in a, uh, you know, in a good way, right? You know, because I, I, you, I hope that we'll receive it. Yeah, some of the uh, some folks cannot wear the goggles for the uh, yeah. for the two to for either augmented reality VR or even just straight up, what do they call it? VR one hundred and eighty, where it's like uh, more of a two D uh, left eye right eye stuff. Uh, but some people actually cannot wear those goggles because it makes them dizzy and it'll make them sick. Uh, depending on just you know the the person who's who's uh, wearing them, 
but um, for me, it never bothered me to, to wear the goggles or, and go into the augmented reality or a complete 360 VR environment. I have no problem with it personally, but I don't I'd like from, for instance, my wife, she's not, I, she doesn't like spinning around, you know, so, <laughs> so I'm not sure, you know, but uh, hopefully when they get to the point of holographic uh, projection, it will be something that doesn't make you dizzy. That would be nice. I think, yeah, it's a barrier to a lot of people. We, we tend to forget, you know, we can go so far with technology, but sometimes it's something as simple as the human body is going to bring it back. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's uh, yes. you know, it's going to present some barriers there. Um so yeah, Paul, uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Obviously, you know, I, I feel like I've learned a lot from that chat. It's just nice to hear about your kind of experiences um, and, oh, and where that kind of love for, for media and multimedia came from. Right. Um, and that's uh, that's what, you know, the the show, the NAB show is ultimately what led me to Playbox. Yeah, which I mean, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's crazy to think about just how, in, obviously with, with the last few years and COVID and, and obviously like you were saying, shows being postponed. Uh, it is crazy to think, you know, just how much good shows like NAB, IBC have done for the broadcasting industry and, and companies in it. Huge, huge eye openers, you know. And for me, that was uh, 2004 when I bumped into Playbox at NAB and uh, ha have been loving it ever since. Love the oh, solutions. They they work and they, it's all about reliability, ease of use and image quality those are kind of my three yeah. top criteria how, how reliable is the system uh, be it software hardware or a combination of both how reliable is it how easy is it to use and how good is the image quality those have always been my three primary points and then you know after those three then you get into things like compatibility what kind of files can it take in or out and and that kind of thing and some of the other uh finer points but uh i'm happy to say that uh playbox has always delivered whether it's uh simple uh play out solutions or capture solutions or even in the case like i was describing earlier uh with my brother-in-law's company using um airbox with multiple air boxes chained together to deliver uh, left and right eye stereo uh, stereo video type solutions uh, worked perfectly for that uh, during a, a tour of the entire US. Yeah, so. I, I continue to be amazed at, at some of the projects that uh, Playbox is used in, whether it be in the past that I, I, I just hear about like today um and and even some future projects that, that come our way there's always something that's going to surprise you yes um, but sir. I'm, I'm so glad obviously the solutions work for you paul oh yeah and um, work work for your clients well, that's, you know at the end of the day that's what it's all about uh, i think most people are kind of have the mindset that i do in terms of of these solutions when you find a solution that that works and is reliable every day week after week 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 after week month after month year after year you kind of stick with it. There's no reason, no reason to look elsewhere. hundred percent. I'm glad to have you, Paul. So, you know, are there any kind of exciting projects that you've got coming up for Studio Tyson that you can talk to us about? It can be absolutely anything. Uh, well, the, the, the big ones that we just finished were for uh, Lions Club, which is a volunteer organization here in the U.S. Uh, and actually around the world. But we did something for their U.S. division where they uh, do vision screening for kids that are mostly under eight years old and they go around and they do free free vision screening for those Brilliant. kids um just yeah no charge and they have these really amazing uh technology that's completely touchless and they basically can tell from six feet away and the machine tells uh tells whether there's a problem with the eyes or not that needs further attention and so uh they they typically screen millions of kids every year uh for free and provide you know what they call a referral which is a recommendation to see an eye doctor if they if they find anything that, that needs attention yes, but uh yeah. of course with covid that happened in 2020 everything got put on hold for the better part of 18 months so they uh in 2021 they they wanted to kickstart and restart the campaign 
and they hired Studio Tyson to help them do that. So we created a six minute video, which is on our website, studiotyson.com. You can see it, it's uh, there in our videos, uh, on our videos page. And then uh, we also uh, help them rebuild from the ground up their website. So it's a Lions Kids Site USA dot org is the website and we we did that entire website for them as well as the videos that are on the website yeah no that's absolutely fantastic stuff but i love hearing about projects like that and, sure. and you know uh, companies just helping those guys out with, with things like this and helping them you know do the good things right, that they're doing yeah. which is always nice to good hear. cause good cause oh, so yes. we we uh we gave them a a, a good deal a price break and all that stuff, you know, yeah. to help facilitate what they're doing. Brilliant stuff. And then Paul, if, if anyone listening wants to get in touch with Studio Tyson, any companies, uh, if they want to inquire about anything that you've talked about today, uh, how can they go about doing that? Uh, just studiotyson.com. All of my inf- information is there. My phone number is there. My email address is there. It's paul at studiotyson.com. Awesome. So we'll link that in the podcast description, Paul. So anyone on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, you guys can head to the description uh, and and you can contact Paul through there. Uh, So again, Paul, thank you so much, mate. Really do appreciate it. And uh, hopefully speak to you soon. I appreciate it, Neil. Thank you very much. Cheers, Paul.